Hey everybody, just wanted to let you know before we start the episode that this episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by Cobalt Press. Cobalt Press is having a Kickstarter right now for the Empire of Ghouls. It is a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign from them for characters levels 1 through 14 and it takes your heroes deep into the realms of undead. Explore a kingdom of terror and bloodshed ruled by vampires and go far below the earth in the Underdark in a mighty ghoul empire. The massive 5e campaign will include both new Underdark lore as well as tons of new mechanics for undead monsters, magic, and more. With two books, count them two, both an adventure book and a player guide. The Kickstarter is live and ends Friday, May 31st. And guess what? It's already over 400% funded and blowing through the stretch goals. You are going to want to check out the Empire of Ghouls from Cobalt Press. Everything they do is amazing, play-tested, edited, beautifully arted. That's a chef kiss right there. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intracasso. On the show, we've got two, count them, two awesome interviews. It's a super-sized episode. We are going to be talking with first the one and only Alex Kammer, and then we are going to be talking with Wolfgang Bauer. Alex, my first interview, is all about writing He's the creator of Game Hole Con. He has created harassment policies for a bunch of conventions. He is just incredible uh, and is doing a lot of good work both on the creative and organizational fronts of the tabletop role-playing game hobby. So let's jump into my interview with him. Okay, everybody, now I'm here with one of my favorite people ever. Alex Kammer, welcome to Tabletop Babble. It's awesome to have you here again. For people who don't know, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? Well, it's awesome to be back. Thanks for having me and thanks for uh, clearing a little time out of your busy schedule to make it happen. I am the director, founder, owner of a little convention called Gamehole Con, which is an annual tabletop gaming convention Uh, held here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, every fall. Uh, This year, the dates are October 31 through November 3. We're always uh, always in uh, early November. Um, That's one. Two is I am one of the owners of True Dungeon. Uh, That is the uh, immersive dungeon experience that most people have. If you've experienced it at all, it would have been at Gen Con. We also now uh, run at Gamehole Con and Origins as well and have done a few of the PAX South shows. So True Dungeon is another one of my tabletop gaming uh, uh, endeavors. And beyond that, uh, like you, James, I do a lot of writing. I do some DMs Guild stuff. I've wrote, written a lot of CCC for uh, GameOlcon. I've written some other, uh, a, a lot of 5e adventures, both small press and uh, for the DMs Guild. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, seems to be in addition to being a lawyer and other things. <laughs> uh, it's a, I'm, it's a, it's busy days. Let's put it that way. And uh, and it's what's great because I love that uh, I'm being involved in my hobby. Uh, something that I love very much um, increasingly, and that's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is incredible. Uh, the amount of stuff that you do in the hobby uh, would make one think that you are in the hobby full time, but you are also have, uh, like you, you just mentioned, you're a lawyer, you are a business owner, you are a father. Uh, so you've got a lot going on in your life. Uh, when do you sleep exactly? <laughs> yeah, that, that's I get that question a lot. It's, um, you know, it's here and there, you know, <laughs> as I can. <laughs> you, you know how when you get home from work the, for the normal job, and then you go and say, all right, I'm going to chill out a little bit. I'm going to watch TV or something like that. Basically, I just don't do that. <laughs> uh, exactly. You know, I, I just, you know, I feel I'm pretty type A. Uh, and I like being busy. So my time is really full and I like it that way. My wife thinks I'm an absolute lunatic, you know, that I have a laptop open all the time. And, you know, it's just, but, you know, it's just my personality. So it works for me. It's not, uh, your, you know, your mileage may vary. Let's put it that way. I'm not, I don't recommend it. Um, but that's just sort of my jam. Totally. I, I feel that it's, uh, I would be making someone else crazy, uh, if I weren't right. <laughs> that's like right. that's, that's, right. that's kind of how I feel. It's like, uh, this is, this saves all of you. So trust me. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. And like you said, you've, you've done a ton in the convention space and you're one of the first, 
perhaps the first in our tabletop convention uh, hobby, right, to adopt some more, uh, I, how would I put this, some better policies, I guess is really the best way to say it, about harassment and that sort of thing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because not only have you done it for GameholeCon, you've helped other big conventions like Gen Con and Gamma uh, write their own policies about harassment and such. Yeah, I appreciate that. The subject I care very deeply about. So I mentioned earlier that I'm a lawyer, and the type of lawyer I am informs this tremendously. I'm a personal injury lawyer, so that means I do a lot of civil rights work. Uh, I have uh, I represent victims of sexual assault to try and get justice for what happened to them. I represent people who get uh, hurt through all kinds of negligent acts, uh, from you know the sort of routine car accidents to all the different kinds of things. So I represent people who have gone through very difficult things, and I try to get them some measure of just some measure of justice, and to get them to the other side. So that deeply informs my view of everything, and uh, that 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 the uh, tabletop gaming and the convention scene is certainly part of that. So as I started GameholeCon with my friends, it's not just me. First of all, I. I you know, I often get too much credit for Game Hole Con. There, there are there are eight of us who play in the Game Hole, which is my physical gaming space, which you will be able to see. I'm excited to show you uh, this fall when you come out as a guest. Which again, I'm delighted that you're going to be able to come out as a guest this fall to uh, visit us. It's a gaming space. It's a pretty cool game room I have above a pub I own, and it's the the eight of us who get together once a week to to play D and D or Call of Cthulhu or Savage Worlds or whatever we're playing. Uh, they all, including myself, run game all con. Uh, and we all have our strengths uh, to help with that. You know, we have a, a variety of professionals who, uh, who are part of the gaming group. And so the, the convention works well. I mean, I, I feel like we could run a really big company based on the, the uh, array of talents we have around the gaming table. But so, but my background of course is, is law. And so what my, what I thought a, what I could do is of course, write le- regulations. That's what I, I do in a day in day out basis is I'm a, I'm a professional legal writer, uh, and, and advocate and arguer. So what I wanted to do was to create policies that first of all, were clear, that were understandable and actionable. And those are all different things. Those are all different goals. Because what I saw were a lot of sort of muddy policies. I mean, everyone says, well, you know, we want things to be safe. We want things to be inclusive. Well, what does that really mean? You know, you got to really spell that out chapter and verse in terms of what is and what is not acceptable. And then also put together provisions that uh, deal with, uh, you know, conduct, bad conduct and how it's handled. And that becomes more difficult to define that it's really a you'll know it when you see it kind of thing. But mostly importantly, it's it's to have uh, an action, a, a plan of action in place. So people that are at your space, if it's a game store or a convention, something happens to them that is bad, it's upsetting. They feel comfortable that there is a process that they can engage easily to have to be to be heard and understood and to have their 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 complaint taken seriously and and action taken immediately. Um, I always you know again I'm based on what I do for a living. If someone comes forward and makes a complaint, I, I believe they're telling the truth. You would, the process of being a victim is terrible. It's just the, it's an, it's an awful, awful experience. And I just, it stretches my imagination to bounds, which I can, even I can't go for people to, for me to think of people inventing claims because it's just a horrible process, but there still should be some investigation. There still should be a uh, part of this also has to be an element of due process. We are a nation of laws, and there has to be some due process element to any investigation before there's any punishment. Uh, you know, immediately you can separate people and make sure everyone's you know everyone's safe and okay. And if there's anything that has to be done, immediately you get that done. But before you know, really start uh, handing out punishment, whatever that is, there has to be some sort of investigation. Uh, you know, and that's that can vary too, depending on the circumstances. So. That's a long answer. I'm sorry. No, no, it's I mean that's great. That and I think that helps sort of define it, right? Many of us uh, probably don't even think about the harassment policies of conventions until we need to use them, right? It's great to hear the thought process that goes into creating a a process that is fair and also really considers what people who get harassed uh, have to go through. And from a professional who deals with this every single day. <laughs> My goal is what, first of all, was surprising to me, and I guess it's really not that surprising and further upon further reflection, we really didn't have any professionalism guidelines. Uh, so we had, we had, most conventions had conduct policies, but there's nothing that was 
uh, you know, that's, you know, you talk about forward facing policies. There also weren't any backwards facing policies saying, hey, guests who come to shows, industry professionals, uh, if you're a distributor or a, a vendor or whatever, here are policies that we expect you to, to follow based on basic professionalism. Uh, and that is was a little surprising to me. So that was actually job one for me is to draft some tabletop gaming professionalism standards, which um, have now been, uh, and you mentioned Gen Con and, and Gamma, they've all, uh, I've gotten significant buy-in from, from those, from both groups on, on that subject. I mean, the goal here is very simple. That is to have consistency across conventions and the industry so we all know what the behavioral expectations are and we all appreciate what bad behavior is what is not tolerable and what the consequences are and if we can get to that if we can get to uniformity along those lines then we have a real chance of of eliminating it because that's the goal i mean this is the, is to just stop bad behavior from happening and that means not only punishment but also fixing behavior you know, and, and calling it out and saying, this is, this is not acceptable. Uh, and here's what you need to do to stay in tribe. Do you understand? That's a big part of this. As I've gotten more into this subject, an interesting problem is, you know, if you consider a, the, a bad behavior on a continuum, you know, from one side to the other of, you know, fairly, you know, we agree is bad behavior, but is, is, you know, not, not criminal to full on assault or something like that. So if you have the spectrum, bad behavior is on one end, the, the, I guess we'll call it the lesser end, how do you handle that and how do you how can you how can we work with people that that commit those errors and get them back in so in, again with the effort of being inclusive of of trying to keep as many people in the hobby as possible because if we just are arbitrarily not arbitrarily but just aggressively banning people we're pushing them to different fandoms. We're just pushing the problem down the road and I, I think a lot of behavior can be fixed if people understand what the true expectations are, what is and what is not acceptable. And we can accomplish that, I believe, if we have uniformity among all conventions, that we're all talking about the same thing. We're all agree that here's how we're going to handle it. Um, and we're getting there. And I'm ex- so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. So far, so good anyway. It's great to see movement forward on on this. I know, obviously, we are two of the people least likely to experience harassment at a convention based on the fact that, you know, we're straight white dudes, right? But I do think because of the the work that you do as a professional, right? And because of the work you do as a professional also in this hobby, it is great to see uh, somebody who is saying, okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing all of the layers that are involved in a complex system like this. And it, you know, in a way policies, right. Are, are law, right. If, if you will allow me the metaphor of the, of the convention, right. It's the, these are the rules you are expected to follow. And so there needs to be some sort of clear understanding, I think, that can help people. But I also like that you don't get into every edge case, right? There's there's sort of this like, okay, there are some things that are very obviously harassment, and so you should know what those are. And I think that getting into that sort of keeping something simple that someone like me who doesn't have a law degree can understand is, is really great. Um, do you have guys like me in mind when you are writing stuff like that? Like, okay, I need to know how to do this and I don't need a, I, I don't have a postgraduate degree, so I can't parse it that way. Well, so what, what, what the, what we're doing is trying to, you know, I've made it clear to everyone uh, and a lot of shows have done this. Just go to our site and copy anything you want. You know, uh, take take anything. There's no there's no claim intellectual property on anything when it comes to our policies. And you know what's cool is Gen Con's done the same thing. Uh, I gave a joint speech with uh, David Hoppy, the CFO at uh, of uh, Gen Con at Gamma, and we talked about that. How this is a share and share like you guys, anyone out there can come and take our policies and use them, adopt them as 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 your own. Um, and I, I think that's great. Uh, there's no reason to be proprietary about this stuff. I mean, again, if the goal is to make the hobby better, let's let's share this stuff. Um, so you don't need to have a nuanced understanding of any legal field to to have good policies. Go out and grab them, and they should read as fairly common sense. I mean, they are commonsensical. That's the whole point of them. It becomes more challenging. Uh, I think that the what you, it's one thing just to be able to take your policies and put them on your site and think, oh, good, I'm done. That's not the end of it. You have to really understand them and appreciate that when you have an event and something happens that you're ready to 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 address it. Now, you know, for instance, there there's back to the sort of my example of the continuum of bad behavior. 
there's a big difference between behavior like someone is taking too many photographs of a cosplayer than you know cornering someone in a bathroom. Those are very different situations and require very different responses and 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 very different punishments. One is the the, the end is law enforcement, uh, and the other one is you know hey man or 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 gal or whoever that's not cool. Do you understand why this is not, you can't, you can't continue to do this or else we have to become more involved. This, this has to escalate and we don't want to escalate this. We want everyone you included to have a good time. Please, please follow our regulations. It, it requires a little bit of willingness to be, you know, somewhat confrontational, not, but not aggressively. So, but you have to, you can't pretend if someone makes a complaint about something, you can't pretend it didn't happen or say, oh, I'll get to it later. I'm busy. You really got to be prepared to have uh, staff in, in place to deal with it and deal with it uh, with uh, earnestly and honestly and openly and, you know, and be, and be good at that. That takes a little, you have to, if, if you're running a convention, you have to sort of look around the room and use your common sense and pick the people who you think would be best at dealing with those situations. And, you know, people who with empathy and with people that are, that are, uh, you know, that can, that can communicate well. That's, that's the problem is that just having good policies, even making a big blow up of them and putting a banner up. Great. Again, step in the right direction. You really want to show what your policies are, but you got to have staff that are ready to, to, to act in accordance with your policies. And the nice thing is uh, the best way to prevent uh, stuff from happening is to be ready for it. You know, I, I, we, we've had, you know, we've tried to be ready for, uh, for, for this kind of thing for a while. And we've just had very little, very little to do at our show, which has been great. But if something does happen, you know, then that would be, that'd be bad. But if it does, we're ready. And, but the hope is it doesn't happen at all, but you have to be ready if, for something to happen. And that's the other part that I encourage any, any organizer to keep in mind. That uh, these are just not magic words that you put out and it cures all behavior. It's just that's that's the start. It's not the whole thing, though. Oh, and one more thing too on this subject is that you're absolutely right. I'm a uh, a middle aged uh, white straight guy. Um, I I am not trying to position myself as the you know the banner carrier for inclusivity. Uh, although I feel very strongly about it, it's something I care very deeply about or, or in safety. I think I'm doing my part, but I, I'm not trying to be the spokesperson of this very important, could call it a movement, but uh, the, the desire to have uh, to have safe and uh, inclusive spaces. Uh, but I'm willing to help in in any way I can, and this seems to be the best way that I can is to to contribute. Um, you know, what little my my uh, I guess my intellectual worth is is worth on, on this subject, uh, and and put it out there and share it for all. Uh, I, I don't need to, uh, you know, again, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to give the impression that I'm trying to champion something that I probably shouldn't be. <laughs> so I want to just make that clear too. Totally. Totally. And I, you know, that is a, a really good clarification. We're talking about your writing policy, uh, but I think of equal interest, uh, possibly more interest to our listeners too, is your work writing material uh, for D&D, right? And the last time we were on here, we we talked about this a little bit. I'd love to delve into this some more. Um, so obviously you're a writer by trade in your legal profession. So I write and produce television commercials and I listen to people who uh, like podcasts about people who write television episodes and commercials and stuff like that. And a lot of them do what you do. They do legal writing and it's because it, your writing, right? And it becomes this thing where it's like you learn how to write quickly. You learn how to write well. You learn the format for writing. Um, you learn how to present information in an interesting way. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how did you get started writing material for Dungeons & Dragons? Well, I think like all of us, uh, you know, I've been playing D&D for a long time. And uh, I've done a lot of just scratching around with, you know, homebrew stuff. You know where you just write write uh, adventures for your your friends that you're playing with, and uh, you put it forward like that. My my uh, it was a number of it was only gosh about ten years ago that I actually formally started attempting to publish, uh, and uh, that's been really interesting. It's been fun, you know, because I've written. I'm so I've I've got a lot of stuff out there in the legal world. I've got a lot a lot a lot of writing out there. Um, so the the spinning out words is not my challenge you know some people struggle with that i i don't have that that problem but it's been interesting as i've gotten gone along with my the product releases how i've gotten better at it and i would have never have thought that you know i, I guess in my hubris i thought ah, i can do this i can write a, a D D adventure as well as anyone look at all this look at all the stuff i've written over the course of my professional career but you know the stuff i wrote 
10 years ago is just not as good as the stuff I'm writing today. And it's, I, it's, it's still a process and you still learn every day uh, when you go through it and you write, when you write adventures uh, and my stuff is just better today, but uh, yeah, it's been a really cool, cool process. And I've learned a lot. Uh, one of one really big uh, suggestion and well, it's just a mandatory thing if you're going to publish is having a great editor. And I think this is pretty universal. I think everyone will agree with that. It's just so important, man. If you have a good partnership with, uh, you know, someone who could first of all do sort of a developmental read, who can who can read for continuity and logic, and also someone then could also then just straight edit. And, and, and fix your errors. Uh, and then sort of in between, which is the continuity errors, that's how they interact with, especially you and I write Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons errors. It's, it's easy to build in, um, you know, without even realizing it, some, some uh, logic errors based on just the way the rules and the mechanics of the game work. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's really something it's been fun. It's been fun to get better at it. And I look back and say, man, I wasn't that good back, you know, in, uh, in 08 or whatever, you know, when I started this, um, but it's, uh, but it's been fun. So, you know, so I've written a lot of CCC stuff and published stuff under our own imprint and been written for a number of publishers. So it's been great. It's fun to talk with you about writing stuff on Twitter. The great box text debate that uh, that raged across the internet one weekend. It was fun to like get your voice in there. Do you like older modules as well? I I see you because I know you are a collector of things. Um, you have a very large collection of official Dungeons and Dragons stuff throughout the years, and your Twitter account uh, your Twitter account is just this great like historical record of things that you have and and sort of talking about when they came out and uh what they meant to you and and how they changed the game has been really fascinating so i want to talk about that too but do you have a a love for that older stuff and do you find that it influences your writing sometimes uh it definitely has for me with fifth edition because fifth edition has a little bit of an older feel to it yeah, yeah, and actually, it was quite frankly D and D Next slash Fifth Edition that got me into writing, uh, because for that very reason, uh, because I, uh, you know, I looked at when when three point five, three point seven five Pathfinders, looking at that, and said, well, you know, it's fun to play. Um, but I don't really have a desire to write in it. It just seems a little, it just wasn't for me. And it was until, when, uh, the, you know, 5e came into its, you know, now robust form that really got me excited about writing. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, absolutely. Uh, my jam are modules. So if anyone out there has the the Goodman Games uh, reprint of Caves of Chaos, the uh, Keep on the Borderlands, I wrote a forward in that book. And I wrote a forward on about modules, about how they came to be. And OD and D didn't have modules, and because their take was, "Hey, you, we're not going to write your adventures for you. Here's just a framework to go do it." Well, that changed when modules they started to splash on modules and and saw how much they how many they sold. <laughs> so, modules became a real big deal in the uh, the um, late '70s, early '80s, and then exploded in the mid '80s. Uh, and so I love the, I adore those. I mean, I was, when I was a, so that for me, was like 15, 16, I'd go to a game store and I saw something like tomb of the lizard King, you know, on the shelf. And it just blew my mind. I was like, Holy, I just can't even believe how the, I, the, the possibilities in this, that someone thought of this and that that's an adventure I could actually go on. I just can't even believe it. Uh, so they really were, were axiomatic for me modules. I just love modules. And I, so that's my reference, my Twitter nonsense. And that is I'm going through my collection of uh, I, I have a, a, a complete set of everything that TSR did uh, and in, in original shrink wrap. And I'm showing each piece uh, as it goes through time. And yeah, talking about the, histor the, the, the historical relevance of it and the importance it is to me and then to other people. And uh, so that's been really fun. But absolutely, the old modules affect my stuff tremendously. No question. No question. I love, I adore those old modules. Although, you know, they're, um, uh, they're, 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 from a design standpoint, they, you know, I, I don't want to disparage, but they do certainly leave, leave something to be desired. <laughs> it come with give, looking at it with modern eyes. Oh, definitely. And I, you know, it's one of those things where you think like you can see as you go through the history of these modules, them figuring this out, right? Like, oh, okay. They, they realized that this was a place they wanted to tell you more stuff, or this was a place they realized they didn't need to tell you as much. Right. Um, and seeing that evolution has been, been really, really good. And one of the things that I take from old modules is the ability to kind of 
let go of certain things. I, I don't know about you. When I first started writing, I wanted to cover every edge case that I could think of. Like, okay, well, the c- characters could try to overcome this way, or they could overcome this way, or they could overcome this way. And it was like, well, maybe that that thing that you're thinking 1% of people might think about, you just let the DM adjudicate. And that has really helped me because uh, older modules uh, have almost no guidance. <laughs> <there. laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, the we're right on the cusp of uh, the release of the the Salt Marsh redo, and the U series U one through three, in my opinion, was a real pivoting point in the history of modules for TSR. That was the first. If you go back and look at those that 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 trilogy uh, and compare it to older modules, this is, was a real step towards what we would consider modern design with more more directive to the DMs uh, and guidance and help, you know, and, and some, you know, suggestion of talking about, you know, how to accommodate different play styles and things like that. Much more like what you'd see if you picked up uh, any one of the modern 5e hardbound uh, adventures, you know, which gives, you know, all kinds of information. But you're absolutely right. It's that while resisting the urge to overwrite your adventures. So, you know, try to not to accommodate every fringe <laughs> fringe potential, you know, that just can't be done. But uh, yes, absolutely. The, the older modules gave us no guidance. And so that was, you know, that that sort of ties back into this phony debate about box text. And I say phony because, what are we? What, I mean, what are we talking about? That see the you know you may the only real debate about box text that makes sense to me is you don't want to write too much of it if you're going to have it be if it's going to be an adventure league module that's going to be run at a at a a a con especially if it's a loud con because you can't you can't just narrate you can't just read a bunch of stuff uh, because people can't hear it uh, if it's loud. That's about the only limitation that I do because, you know, just like the old modules, you look at something and if you don't want to read it, you don't read it. You know, I mean, every, every piece of box text I write and I write long ass box text. I really do. I like it. Um, but I don't have any expectation for people to read it to their players. This is something that's a tool for the DM to set the mood and try to communicate my, my word picture that I, that I'm trying to set the scene. I don't even read my box text. When I run my stuff, I don't read my box text. I just read it and say, oh, that's right. This is this is the mood and idea and concepts I was trying to convey. And then I summarize it because it sounds weird. It's just my style. I don't like to read to my players. But that doesn't somehow invalidate box text. And the other piece of it is, as you know, we all know, 95 plus percent of RPG materials that are purchased are never run. They're just read. And so as a as an author, I want to deliver not only a good playing product, something that's fun to play, but also that's a good read. Um, and so box text is a piece of that. So, um, you know, to the extent that, that this makes me pro box text, which is thing, again, I think is a phony position in the first place. I certainly am. Uh, I think it's a, it's a nice piece and something that happened. I think it was, it was, you'll see it was birth uh, in, in the U series. It's really a fascinating thing, right? And I know it was uh, framed as a fierce debate breaking out, but it really was just a discussion kind of uh, about box text and what it means and how it's displayed and all that kind of thing. And it's uh, it's a fascinating thing to me, um, box text. So I am interested to sort of see uh, what people, what comes out of that, where people experiment uh, and how they change it. Because I uh, am in agreement that no box text <laughs> without some sort of replacement um, that gives you the same things you're talking about is a is a bad idea. Anytime you're reading a textbook, um, you've probably run into some issues there. So uh, yeah, yeah, it really is a uh, a fascinating thing. So as far as adventures go um what type of modules do you like to write you know what are you what are you interested in writing what is your your style would you say okay yeah you know i that's interesting i would a couple of years ago i'm not sure i would have been in a position to answer that but now i've written enough i've looked at them all and i've seen some commonalities and what i like to write are uh investigations everything i think I think just about everything I've ever written is an investigation of some sort. It's a, um, there is something that's happening and you need to get to the bottom of it, uh, or it's to find something or to find someone or something like that. So I like the, 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 the trajectory of starting in a place of civilization and then radiating outward, following a path of information and clues. That is my style. That's what I, that's what I write. All the CCC I've written is that way. 
Um, so that is a lot of who's really the the uh, the evil power at play. Uh, you know, who's really the bad guy here? It's not obvious. Um, and or it's uh, what we were looking for. It turns out not what we're really looking for kind of thing. So I that's what I like. Uh, that's the kind of I think that's the kind of stuff I like to play too. I like to have, you know, geez, we all spent enough time grinding through dungeons. Uh, and that can be really fun, you know, with your friends and you do that. But that's not for me, you know, week after week is not what the kind of play I want to do. So I like a little more than that. And so that's what I try to write. I think I'm definitely an investigation style uh, adventure writer. Yeah, and those are hard. I, th- you know, I think investigations, particularly in D anD D, because investigations are not the focus of every adventure, and so you don't necessarily have the tools you would in, like, a say, a Gumshoe RPG or that kind of thing. They can be really hard to write. Uh, I feel like those get scrutinized more for things like plot holes and that sort of thing uh, when you're when you're on the investigation trail. Uh, what advice do you have for people writing investigations? Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly as the, you're, you definitely are, that's a challenging type because you're absolutely right. They can, they're easy to, if you have a logical flaw, it's really obvious and it'll, you, yeah. So that, that's a, that's a, that's something you really have to be careful. And, and I would suggest if you're writing an investigation, have lots of people read it. Uh, and to come come back with different perspectives about uh, you know how they see how players can uh, how can, how they can foil it or how they can how you've taken them in the wrong direction and so to make sure that you you have good continuity but two um, gosh magic is really hard to deal with when you're writing investigations you know because we have so much good there's a whole school of magic you know divination magic that is problematic when you're trying to keep things secret um so to to not to to do something that is oh it just doesn't work um you know and i don't like doing that that's kind of a that's that's kind of a cop out and sometimes it's necessary like in tomb of annihilation you just say well you know this stuff just doesn't work here okay you know if you and that's the only way to work because if you allowed allowed you know whatever eighth level characters to have the full run of their spells then that would have been a much different adventure and much shorter one um so you know i understand the need for it uh but i really try not to say um the magic doesn't work because of reasons you know uh and that's the hardest part uh and that's i think i think that's how you distinguish yourself and i'm not sure i'm not claiming that i've have maybe maybe people out readers uh, your listeners out there are singing about well, camera's a hack he you know he doesn't he hasn't uh he still hasn't he hasn't convinced me that he can write this stuff well and that may be true um but i'm trying and uh, it's it's hard it's hard to deal with that in a way that is uh still fun for the players it's logical for the players and it's also fun for the dm that's that's the biggest that's the biggest challenge i think is dealing with with uh with magic when you're when you're doing doing investigations and then in terms of the 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 style of you know when you're laying your breadcrumbs of clues to do so that you have um, that not every clue is is if you don't find it it's game over or you're just stuck uh, but also without being heavy-handed and you know feeding very obvious uh, sign poles to the to the characters I think that's a that's a challenge and as I've gone on and, and written more of these I I uh, you know the the, the 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 I rely more and more on play testing. Uh, and, uh, and which is, that's the other thing. And whatever you write, geez, play test everything. I mean, <laughs> play test it as much as you can. Uh, because I'm always amazed that the, what I learned when I play test stuff and, uh, it makes, got it made, it's made my stuff so much better, uh, by, uh, having it really out there and have, have people kick it around for me. Yeah. Yeah. It is, uh, play testing is worth its weight and in gold, right? Um, that is huge. And you're, uh, are your kids old enough that they are playing D and D now? I know they play games with you. Yeah, yeah, my my uh, my my girl, my oldest is f- in fifth grade, and I run a game of D anD D for her and her friends, and it's just awesome. It's just it's they're just so good at it. They intuitively understand cooperative play. They intuitively understand shared resources. They intuitively understand the world, and they don't have they're not familiar with any of the tropes. So it's really a delightful group to run for because they they they're so scared as they go through the dungeon they're checking everything and you know as, as where we'd go like well there would never be a trap door there. sure of course yeah yeah, yeah. they they have no idea <laughs> like the first time the first time they found a pit trap they're like what like why would someone do that you know and it was it's just it's so great um, so uh, um, yeah the playing with kids is is tremendous and uh, now you know with because of I've got kids that are in that age I look at every product with that eye you know like is this 
this is something my guys are going to like, uh, or is this their age appropriate? And, uh, you know, and we have, fortunately we have a lot of good stuff out there now for kids that are of that age. We really do. We really do. And it is uh, it is so fun to play with new people uh, because it helps you recapture the magic, too, of playing for the first time. Like I was uh, I, my wife just started playing with me a couple of years ago and ran into her first mind flare. And uh, it's it's uh, we're playing with a group of, you know, mixed experience players. And so she was among the people who were like, not didn't know how terrified she should be. Right. Um, and everybody else was. And so it was this great, like, she's like, well, I don't understand. It's just a, it's just a squid head. Like it's just a person with a squid head. And it was like, Oh no, you don't know. Uh, so, you know, there's all that kind of, uh, that joy that you get, uh, when, when everything is new and the novelty of it all is great. And it really is, uh, super important to see a new generation of, role players coming up right because they're going to continue the hobby uh, after we're gone and you have done stuff with that at game hole con right like don't your kids run games at game hole con they, they do they do and a lot of other kids do we have a very robust kids track where it's uh you know grown-ups who are approved you have to apply and we have a process of of checking people to run games for kids uh to make sure they're appropriate um and also kids run games for kids and that's been a lot of fun it's just there's you know for a for an old gamer like me, seeing a bunch of kids around a table um, laughing and 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 uh, you know uh, rolling dice and not even really maybe using miniatures, but maybe even not that um, is really awesome. So it's uh, I I adore it and uh, it's been very successful. And people, you know, we're all of you know those 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 of us who you know uh, got into D and D in the eighties. Most of us have kids now, and we want to pass that hobby on and. Uh, it's it's neat seeing how many how many of our attendees now bring their kids and we you know we have a lot of families at our show which is great uh and it's uh it's it's cool to see it's very cool to see yeah yeah it is it's just uh it's great to see stuff like that happen when uh when families are getting together and and people are coming to conventions and you you, you mentioned uh, new new players and this is this is i think you'll get a kick out of this one you know so i've got this book i've been writing for a while and it's it's about it's kind of a it's 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 pretty adult D and D in that it's it's uh it's sahagan it's an adventure that the sahagan are the main uh, bad guys at the end and it, unbelievably great timing that's coming out at the same time as salt marsh that was completely unplanned in my part you know, the, <laughs> that is awesome. i got the I, I yeah i got the play test stuff back in August, october and i said holy cow you got to be kidding me this is coming out just as i'm writing a sahagan book this mm-hmm. is tremendous <laughs> but um anyway so it's about uh you know sahagan capturing important terrestrials air breathers and doing terrible things to them for religious reasons. They're trying to uh, free the shark God from his imprisonment and launch the red feast. And it's pretty, you know, so a lot of doomy sort of creepy stuff that's happening that the player characters can figure out and try to thwart. Um, But anyway, my wife is my first proofreader and she's a really good proofreader because she's a really slow reader. I mean, she reads every character of every word. Yeah. Um, That's what I don't. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm terrible. I'm, I'm the worst proofreader. I, I can't, you know, when she hands something back to me and circles my ears, I'm like, I can't even believe some of the, how, some of the stupids I've done. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. So then when I send in a, a book to a publisher, they said, wow, this is really clean. And they think I'm such a good writer. And I said, well, you know, I've had a little help. But, uh, but anyway, so I was working. I needed my wife to finish up because I was coming up on a deadline. And I was out to, we were out to dinner. And my mother-in-law was with it because it was my wife's birthday. And I said, honey, can you, you really, if you can finish up the edits on this book, that'd be really great. And my mother-in-law says, what is that about? I said, well, it's a, you know, a D&D adventure. I'm, I'm getting close to wrapping up. And I need to get the proofs done so I can get it to their actual editors and uh, we can move on. She goes, well, I'd like to read it. And I'm thinking, oh, uh, all right. Um, cool. I mean, you don't, she's never, doesn't know anything about D and D and this is like, you know, there's some, it's not, um, you know, like lamentations of the flame, uh, the flame presence kind of stuff, but it's still, you know, there's some sacrifice stuff and, you know, <laughs> sure. You know, uh, just like, so you know, are bad dudes. <laughs> yeah. There's nasty, nasty stuff. Yeah. You know, they're doing, they're doing bad things to people. So I said, all right. So I gave it to her and it's, you know, it was a pretty lengthy book. So, you know, it's a full, uh, full length hardbound book. Um, and, uh, she gives it back to me. She, uh, in two days later, she read the whole thing and she said, wow, it was a really great read. You're, you know, she said nice things about, you know, my being good writer and stuff like that. And she, but most surprisingly, she said, I, this is a game I want to play. I'd like to play this game. 
And I said, holy cow. I said, all right, well, you know, I tell you what, you get some friends together. Uh, I will put together a, a scenario for you and we'll, we'll, we'll play some some uh, 70 and older first time D and D. Uh, and so we're getting, we're still planning that, but we're going to get that done. And that's going to be, that's going to be a pretty cool experience. I think for people who are that age, who've never played and want to give it a shot. So I'm, I'm excited about it. And it's, what's so cool about it is it's your writing that uh, brought her into the fold. You know what I mean? Like how, how great is that? Oh man, that is awesome. We're getting uh, close to wrapping up here. So we should talk a little bit about this product uh, because as of not as of the recording of this, but as of the time this podcast drops, you have a Kickstarter for that product going on right now, right? Yeah, it's going to be coming out. Uh, so yeah, this will be, I think it's going to start on May 14. There's a little bit up in the air, but it's going to be, you know, around mid-May. And the book is called Sea King's Malice. And if you like, um, you know, I pronounce, pronounce it Sahagan, some uh, uh as, as bad guys, what I've done is um, built out a whole bunch of different types of more powerful Sahagan that are opponents here. So my book has three parts. One is... Uh, oversee adventure investigation trying to figure out what the heck's going on uh the middle third is a um a remote uncharted volcanic island where all kinds of weirdness happens and you do some overland adventuring and the final third is under the waves 500 feet below the surface to a sahagan city um you know which is it's called the city of feasts and it's a terrible place and the players have to um if they're successful and gotten to that point, have a chance to rescue the object of their mission from the first place. Um, so it's been, been a lot of fun. I've been working on it for a long time and I'm very proud of it. But anyway, that's launching um, sometime in mid May. And if, if you like those kinds of adventures, I ask that you kick it out and, and uh, I really appreciate it that you um, let me, let me talk about it. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think it's a, uh, it's going to be great. It sounds really, really exciting. People should definitely go check it out on Kickstarter. Another neat part of it is that Beetle and Grimm is participating. Yeah, um, yeah, they're they're doing. I have uh, three primary ships that are involved in the uh, in my book, and they're doing these really sweet maps of all three big deck plans that have cloth on one side and I believe dry erase on the other. And uh, so these are going to be not only really useful for my book, um, but they're going to be evergreen. They're going to be great for, so the three different basic uh, styles of ship too. So uh, really useful for people to use in their home campaigns, their homebrew for anything, uh, because these, these certainly be reusable and, and, and uh, evergreen. So I'm, I'm excited about that too. That should be. Yeah. And totally usable with salt marsh, which is just great. Uh, yeah. 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 It's crazy. It's crazy that how that dovetail, um, and then beyond that, uh, you know, those uh, thanks to all of you out there who have come to Gamehole Con. Uh, we love having you. You can come and see our friend James. He's going to be one of our guests. We have lots of really cool guests this year. Um, it's not official, official, but I'm confident enough to say that I'm 95% sure that Deborah Ann Wall is going to come this year um, and lots of other people. We have, I mean, check out our guest list. We have, we put the most amazing group of people together every year and that's, that's happened again this year. And so uh, registration starts in June, you know, mid June or so you can see that on our site. Um, you don't want to miss that. It's a, especially, and if you're an adventure league player, I mean, man, we, the, what we have planned this year keeps growing every year at adventure league hall, but I, I kid you not that the current plan is to have a hundred simultaneous tables going at this, you know, at one time in this big hall. Um, and, and how to sort that out, there's going to be sort of a big central octagon command stage and then radiating sort of think about slices of pie off in every, in, in the, the complete circumference of it uh, with some, you know, removable pipe and drape so we can control noise. But we do things like we pay for carpeting in that hall to keep the noise down and we do everything we can to try to make a really good experience. We're not trying to have, you know, the biggest hall in the world, you know, that's not game will con, you know, obviously with a name like that, it's not a commercial endeavor. We're just having fun. Uh, this is, we, we are not trying to make money with the show. We're just having, trying to have a lot of fun. Uh, and we try to deliver a great, uh, adventure league experience as we do with every experience. Um, we want to make sure that the, that, you know, the noise is, is, is reasonable that DMS are qualified. That's another thing. We have a whole other process that we're going through this year to make sure that there's, there's actually a vetting for DM so that we just don't have any bad experiences. We've had very few, but you know, my, the acceptable number is zero. Um, and so we're, we're, uh, we're uh, working uh, very hard on that. So I think if you, especially if you're a D and D player and an AL player, I think you get a real kick out of our show. Uh, all the admins are there, and you know most of the Watsy staff are there, and so it's it's going to be great. And I can't wait to have you out and show you the game hole and show you how we con. 
Yes, yes. I am very excited to be there. Uh, I'm going to have a couple panels going, and uh, I'm getting my uh, my games together that I'm going to run. I know at least one. There will be at least one game where I run players battling multiple Tarasks. So, uh, so we should get ready for that. Yeah, yeah. If your uh, if your style is investigation, I think my style is probably Gonzo over the top. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. That's awesome. I you know I wish I could you know I, I'm going to I'm going to try you know I'm gonna I'm gonna try to you got to do things that you're not comfortable with sometimes too and I'm gonna try to do something like that too uh, I think especially for some of the if, the next time I write for AL I'm gonna do some of that some really like oh my gosh this is hard <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah absolutely absolutely it is uh it's one of those things where I had to uh I went in and I bent the rules and I you know um and still they uh, that Taras gets its butt handed to it by those players every time even with its power-ups and ranged attacks and things like that so but it is fun uh it's fun and i am super excited to come uh it's it's just looks like an amazing convention everybody i know uh who goes says it's their favorite of the year and i was truly sold on it last year when i was waiting uh for a plane after origins and you were in the airport there uh and you sold myself and uh joey hake on it as well so yes uh so i am sold i will be there people should check it out if people want to know more about you and what you're doing where should they go alex and what should they do uh, the uh, site for the show is gameholcon.com. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll find that. Um, I have. I'm on Twitter, and I'm doing my ongoing tour of um, TSR product releases through the years. I'm up. I'm about a third of the way through 1991 going forward. Um, that you'll find just if you search Alex Camera. But my handle is at GHC and Tacos. Yeah, I'm a big taco fan. I love tacos, so it is what it is. Um, and, uh, that's about, yeah, we have the game Con Facebook page that we, we try to post stuff there first to get, uh, get everyone can see what we're doing. Like, for example, if you have been watching our, the game Con Facebook page, you will have seen over the last couple of days that our plushie this year, we do a plushie that we, a, a monster plushie that the tremendous John Kavalik artist who, uh, he's the guy who does most of the Munchkin art, um, he designs a plushie for us and we sell these plushies of it's a D&D monster and we they go to charity for like extra life or world builders or something like that. Um, this year the plushie is a displacer beast and it is unbelievably cute and people are losing their minds. So um, that's where you announce that on Facebook first. So um, that's a cool page to follow if you uh, dig our show. Nice. That's awesome. I love that. So everybody go check that out. Uh, come to Game Hole Con. Come hang out with me and Alex. We'll be there. And thank you so much, Alex, for joining me today on Tabletop Babble. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate you making some time. It's always good to catch up with you, my friend. Hey, everybody. Just wanted to take a quick break to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by Elderwood Academy. You know them. They are the makers of fine artisan gaming products. And today I want to talk to you about their spell books. Why? Because I have two of them. And I've said this before. They are the most beautiful thing I have in my gaming collection. They are incredibly handcrafted. They smell great. You can store all kinds of stuff. You can get custom inserts so you can carry around miniatures, dice, pencils, cards, tokens, whatever you game, they got you covered. Plus, there's so many other awesome things. Go check it out at elderwoodacademy.com slash don't split. That's elderwoodacademy.com slash don't split. Okay, and now it is time for Wolfgang Bauer and Megan from Cobalt Press. We are going to talk with them about Empire of Ghouls, the very first adventure path from my favorite gaming company, Cobalt Press. Okay, everybody, now I am here with two of my favorite people, Wolfgang and Megan. Welcome back to Tabletop Babble. For people who don't know, and they really should at this point, uh, Wolfgang, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? Oh, it's great to be here. Sure, I'm Wolfgang Bauer. I'm the publisher at Cobalt Press. Uh, I started back in Lake Geneva back in the day. I worked at Wizards for a while. Uh, these days I run my own shop at Cobalt Press. You have done many, many things that I'm sure people will be familiar with if they've been listening to this show for uh, any amount of time, really. Ghosts of Salt Marsh is the new one, mm-hmm. but yes, things, Tyranny of Dragons, Planescape, yes. a bunch of Al-Kadim, Dragon Magazine, Dungeon Magazine. Yeah, you stick around long enough and 
and you work. It's great. Yes, and of course, the Tome of Beasts, the Creature Codex, the Midgard campaign setting. Uh, oh, all of all the, Megan. Yeah, Cobalt <laughs> Guides, too. So, Megan, I think that's the perfect time to bring you in. Who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? Well, I definitely didn't work on the Tome of Beasts. Don't give me credit for that. They had other wonderful editors on that one. But I edit for Cobalt Press. I guess that's my most impressive title. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, no, I am a freelance editor for Dungeons and Dragons related material, and a lot of my work is with Cobalt Press. The biggest one being Creature Codex. So, woohoo! Absolutely, absolutely. An editor is not only a super awesome title; it is one of the most valuable things for writers. A partner in all things that come out as part of this thing, and good editing is really responsible for making a lot of awesome role playing game products sing, like the Creature Codex. Uh, man, the the editing on that monstrosity—no pun intended—was uh, must have been a a, a big task. Yeah, no pressure, James. Thanks. Thanks for the... <laughs> no, but she killed it. Like, it was yeah. a year's worth of work, uh, just editing and all the stat blocks. And mm-hmm. honestly, like, the way we know that it was great was people will point out errata and errors and stuff. And it's like, there's been a trickle of things about Creature Codex, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. we kind of got it right the first time. Yeah, and that is real hard to do. Uh, and so the the pressure is off because the Creature Codex has come out, but the pressure is back on because the Empire <laughs> yep. of Ghouls is here. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. I've been waiting so long for this one. <laughs> so what is, what is Empire of Ghouls? You know, um, Wolfgang, I've had you on the show several times, and this idea of ghouls in Midgard has always seemed to come up. It It's like you were seeding the idea for this product in various well, podcasts. I'd love to think I was a clever person seeding the idea, but it's really that I'm just obsessed with them. I've been <laughs> writing about ghouls since I looked it up. It's like 1996, 1997. I wrote some of them for Al-Kadim because, of course, the original ghouls come out of Arabian myths and legends. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they came into Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith. Uh, in their sort of more horrific versions of ghouls of the underworld. And then, I, you know, of course, I'm going to put them in Al-Kadim. And I put them in a, a little module in Dungeon uh, called Kingdom of the Ghouls, which mm. was basically done on a dare because uh, Roger Moore, the editor of Dragon at the time, said, you know, drow, 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 they're everywhere. But you know who would really rule the Underdark? The undead. They don't need, like, air or light. They hate light. They barely need food. Um, they don't sleep. They would, they would crush it in the underdark. They would, you know, eat everyone else. Um, I was like, gosh, Roger, you're right. That that's so logical. I kind of want to make that a absolutely horrific premise for an adventure. And he said, yeah, go to town. I don't have time to write that. You do it. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I was like, (laughs) Roger was full of good ideas all the time and occasionally really bad ideas like the giant space hamster, which were bad, but hilarious. Um, anyway, so I went and I wrote Ghouls, and then Brom did the cover art for it, and this Ghoul King is just like, uh, you know, this is where podcasts yes. let me down. I really want to show the art. <laughs> it's, it's Brom art. What more do I need to say? It looked great, and a lot of people ran the adventure and liked it, and the Ghouls have a society. Um, mm-hmm. They they aren't loners. They aren't a pack of wolves going around taking down the weakest and the hindmost. It's like, They've got an army, they've got a priesthood, they've got a society. And that means they're organized, they're amazingly lawful, evilly organized, and um, that makes them scary, right? They, the ragtag bunch of adventurers is up against a whole empire in Empire of the Ghouls. And so in D&D 3.5, a very, very early Cobalt Press release was called Empire of the Ghouls. You can't find it now. Um, it's long out of print. It was 3.5. It was one of our first. It's like black and white and 128 pages. I don't know, something like that. Mm-hmm. And it was great. But before you knew it, we were on to fourth edition and fifth edition, and I never got back to updating it. And now, one of the main Midgard writers, one of the linchpins of Midgard design is Richard Green. Yes. Um, and he put together an outline for a campaign. And Cobalt Press has never done a full storyline like from 1 to 13 or that kind of long-form story. 
Um, and it was high time. People have been asking us, like, when are you doing a full adventure campaign thing? I'm like, eh, it's got to be the right Every thing. convention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, you did this great thing for Prepared, and you do these one-shots. You do a lot of great one-shots. Yeah, yeah, we do. Mm-hmm. When are you going to do something big? Um, soon. <laughs> but so, <laughs> Richard showed up with this, this entire uh, outline, and then we realized, Wow, wouldn't it be great to play some of the uh, some of the races and weird uh, dark subclasses and archetypes and traditions of the Underdark? Um, and we ran with um, both a complete underworld campaign mm-hmm. plus a bunch of extras, right? Like we said, eh, what if, what if we do a bunch of layers anyway, right? Stuff that isn't part of the main storyline, but if we just said here's a, a vampire lair you can put into any Underdark, or, um, you know, here's a bunch of ghosts that are not the way you expect, or a cult to a dark goddess, or any of those things. Um, so we've got the lairs, we've got the player's book, and we've got the main campaign. And between those three things, you're pretty much covered uh, for a full run um, for your first 12, 13, 14 levels, which is, yeah, it's a solid amount of play, but I mean, as Megan knows, the content is its like the whole ghoul society, it's the whole ghoul story, they've got a plan. And the players, of course, don't like their plan once they figure it out what it is. But um, <laughs> I don't know how many spoilers we want to give here, but the nice thing about the Underdark ruled by a maleficent bunch of undead is you know, there's no fiddle-faddle around, are they good? Are they smugglers? Can we make friends with any of these guys? You know, what if we can win some over? No. No, they're the bad guys. Um, and it's pretty clear from the beginning that they, they do not have human interests in heart. Uh, and, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, um, I was going over the culture section recently. Richard turned over a, a revised version of the old 3.5 culture section. I'm like, man, that text is old. We need to totally rewrite it. And then he's like, no, I think I got to keep a couple of those nuggets. I'm like, okay, Richard, we'll, we'll work it. And some of it's just super dark, right? Like ghouls eat flesh. Mm. Mm-hmm. They're, they don't need sleep. They don't need a whole lot of things, but they're they have a pecking order, and they're hungry all the time. So the way they manage their economy is just horrible. <laughs> yeah, that's so. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Like, is you're thinking about the economics of the Underdark in this, and ghouls sort of wanting to eat people all the time. <laughs> um, you or know, elves or halflings, anybody really? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so yes. that is a that's sort of a, a big part of the society then like I, I think a lot of times I love it when I'm reading about the underdark and it's like well these people eat a lot of mushrooms because those grow well in dark spaces and there's no sun and yada yada is that the the kind of thing we're thinking about from the undead perspective what do ghouls need and want to survive do they have an economy that kind of thing yeah, and I mean, we're talking about a couple of pages in like a 250-page sure. yeah, book, yeah. right? It's like the, the Wall Street I, Journal. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> exactly. There's no Bell Prize-winning economists, and then there's our quick little sketch of the Underdark <laughs> uh, uh, food cycle. But yeah, obviously, you know, mushrooms are a thing, weird cave goats, uh, bat meat that the Darrow feast on. And any undead that doesn't need to eat very often or very much is at an advantage, right? So, um, yeah, we talk about that a little um, in the adventure overview section. If you've ever been down in a real cave, and I grew up in the Midwest, so I went into Mississippi River Caves as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not much there, right? Like, there's bats and maybe some guano, and maybe some mushrooms, and a lot of rocks, and water, plenty of good water. But, you know, in terms of, like, (laughs) nourishment, there isn't much. So it's always been a fantasy that there's this giant city of Svurf Neblin, and they're all fat little gnomes. The reality is, you know, creatures in the Underdark aren't well-fed, and drow are skinny, right? (laughs) (laughs) They probably magic up a bunch of food, and that's how we hand wave the whole thing, Mm -hmm. right? Um, The old create food and water type stuff, 
or similar magic items. And for the heroes, it doesn't matter, right? For the most part, they're just like, well, you guys have a big plan, but you're all vile, maleficent creatures, so we're we're here to take down your big plan. And the fact that there are giant carrion beetles or lamp beetles or um, other big insects kind of gives flavor to the setting. Um, but even with my old, old background in biology, it's like I don't want to... F- I don't want to work out the nutrient cycle for the Underdark because it really doesn't balance. Right, right. Yes, yeah, absolutely. There's such a thing as too much realism. I I, I basically, I don't know, Megan, we spend that time talking about dark shrines and like how to get past the outpost, right? I mean. Yeah, well, there's a few spots um, in it. Well, because chapters five and six, so when the players are levels, I think nine to 13, are, uh, are when you see all of the the underworld stuff, and um, you, know, you see some those, of it in chapter four. Well, yeah, you're you're right. Right, yeah, like that's where the majority of the underworld stuff that it takes place. That's where the players are down in the trenches, and now they've got to figure everything out. And um, with that, there are um, there are sections of some of the cities that are, are for flesh people, mm. right? Because there are still <laughs> living creatures that are in there that are that are in the underworld, um, and they oh, do trade. Right. I mean the well, it's not his tourist. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean if, if you want to make inedible. the movie hostile, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> but I uh, know most of the living stuff, it's going to be, they still have trade, right? The, the ghoul empire, it's still an empire. Right. And, you know, their reliance on flesh makes trade in flesh a big deal, mm-hmm. right? So then you've got things like Darrow and stuff that might go to the surface and steal people. And then, hey, now I've got this like walking essentially cattle that I can take and sell to the ghouls, and the ghouls will give me whatever else the ghouls have. So yeah. there is an economy built a lot on on that. Um, and they do have sections of some of their cities that are this is the flesh quarter. If you are a living creature, you stay here. If you are outside of this, you might get eaten. But if you're inside of this, we understand you're probably a merchant and you probably brought us something nice. So we'll maybe not eat you. Um, so it's, yeah, the, it's <laughs> the less edible species have an advantage, right? Like kobolds aren't tasty, cloakers are weird, mushroom folk, I don't know, not that palatable to a ghoul. Right. So the less delicious you are, the more likely it is that you're going to be a successful merchant in the ghoul empire. Sure, sure. That, <laughs> I guess that's true. There are rules, right? That what Megan said is absolutely mm-hmm. right. There's they have laws and they have rules and people who break them, ghouls who break them, um, suffer horrible punishments because if you let anybody just start devouring the merchant class, then things break down. This is fascinating to me and I love the idea of like, you know, this is a ghoul kingdom, but this isn't this isn't like a giant ghoul pack, right? They have society. They have people making clothing and weapons and armor and they have industry and they, you know, this yep. idea of there are these other very unsavory trades in the Underdark, right? Dwerger are known for stealing people and yep. uh, selling them off to do things. So sure, why not, you know, go over here and, and we can keep trade up with our uh, our ghoul allies you know or right or they'll least. trade us some necromantic magic or they'll mm-hmm. trade us some fine weaponry or they'll yeah and i also know this isn't the only undead kingdom right in this adventure hey. uh, there's a there's some vampire stuff going on as well goodness yes that comes in the earlier chapters mm-hmm. and again i don't know how spoilery we want to get but the vampires um show up in the early sections and then there's some stuff that happens later where there is a vampire lair that's a stretch goal on the Kickstarter right now. I'm sure we're going to get this extra extra map and extra vampire encounter, which you can place anywhere. Midgard it does have a vampire kingdom. You can substitute any small barony in the mountains for it in your own campaign, in your homebrew. Um But basically, yeah, vampires rule openly there. The ghouls are their friends. And the two are allied, right? One on the surface and one underneath. Megan, how much do you want to give away about the Blood Kingdom and the the vampire role in all this? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there are definitely two nations that are allied, right? Like they they found an opportunity of hey, let's let's become friends, and then we can take over another area. And part of our story does kind of hinge on on that history. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so, I mean, you don't need to know a ton about Midgard's history, but just the idea that uh, the vampires wanted to rule their neighbor country and they got their ghoul allies or they made a deal with ghouls uh, to help them take over that uh, neighboring country, essentially. Uh, so the vampires now rule three countries on this earth, three areas, three sections of land on the surface, rather than the two that they had previously. And um, part of our story does deal with people that are refugees and exiles from that country. I know in the, the Midgard Heroes Handbook, we actually have a background called the Krakoven Rebel. So that means you're somebody that's from that nation and you're all like, down with the undead, I will slay these people and kick them out of my homeland. Uh, so there's, there's some stuff um, related to that idea because uh, the players at some point have to end up going into that, that nation. Uh, I think our most recent update, actually, uh, our Chapter 2 update, because we're giving a little bit of lore, not quite spoilery, but a little bit of lore, like design updates on each of our chapters. And uh, in the Chapter 2, when they talk about uh, having to infiltrate uh, enemy territory, essentially behind enemy lines and go into a castle full of undead. Uh, and that's that's part of it. So and that, that castle full of undead is not in the underworld. It's on the surface where the vampires rule that freshly claimed territory because this claim only happened about 10 years ago. Mm. You know, so there's still a lot of, you know, local smaller villages of living people that are under subjugation and everything. And the, the vampire nation themselves do a decent job of policing and ruling in such a way that not every citizen there is undead. Right. Like a lot of their cities have a mixture of both and, and the living people don't have a very high class necessarily in the society, but it's not like it's only undead. It's very much in the, the Transylvania. I need some peasants so that I can rule as Dracula kind of mode. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I, I don't think it's hard to fit into a fantasy homebrew campaign, but obviously the empire of the ghoul was the ghouls was, originally a Midgard element. This is a very much a Midgard adventure. We have a whole bunch of conversion notes that will, will help you port it over somewhere else. Um, but it's meant to be run as its own thing, right? It's like, if you don't want to visit Midgard for more than the length of the Empire of the Ghouls campaign, that's fine. Um, but the easiest way to do it is just run it as presented. But I don't know. I have a long history, history as a home brewer. So for people who want to kit bash it, right? Like, Putting the empire somewhere and putting a barony full of vampires somewhere isn't that hard for most mm -hmm. world builders. <laughs> um, eh, depending on how tightly you've packed together your setting to begin with, right? Sure, sure. I, I don't know many homebrewers who have tightly packed underdarks, you know? Yeah, uh, so well, the underdark part is super easy to port in. Mm -hmm. But the like Megan said, like chapter two, there's... There's a vampire castle. Well, can you find room for that in your setting? Mm, probably. Um, <laughs> but I, obviously we're hoping that you just say, ah, I'm running a Midgard campaign and we'll come back to something else later. But, um, but that's that's every every Dungeon Master's call. Totally. So what are some of the, the themes of a campaign that are all about undead? You know, like, uh, especially when we're not just talking about the sort of typical crazy zombie hordes, that sort of thing. We're talking about calculating, thinking undead like vampires and ghouls that have set up these societies and have plots and plans and things like that. Well, what I like about it is that the plots are revealed fairly early. I mean, Megan, you were... I think you and I had this discussion, or maybe yes. Richard and I had this discussion, yeah, right? We did. <laughs> I, I like that because in other adventures, you know, sometimes the players don't really get to know what's going on. They're just kind of dragged around by their nose and they're like, I, I don't know what's happening, but eventually we'll find out. And then, and then eventually you get to see the big bad, right? right. Um, and that happens a lot in video games and in tabletop games too. Uh, I mean, I can think of a few examples, but I don't know if I can name things specifically, but... Sure. Uh, Let's not, like not I, run down guess, the competition. Let's just say what we're doing right. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking more video game stuff. Oh, there's okay. a lot of video games that don't really show you, like, you're you're like, oh, this, all this weird stuff's happening, and then boom, there's a, a big baddie. Mm -hmm. um, whereas then there's other video games that have done it, like, you kind of subtly see the hand of the bad guy the whole time. And we tried to go that, that latter route with Empire of the Ghouls. Um, the players figure out relatively early on kind of who the movers and shakers behind all of it is. Mm -hmm. um so the 
the, then the big challenge becomes actually getting to those movers and shakers, right? Cause they're deep in the underworld. And, um, it, yeah, so it, it's not like, Oh, what there's ghouls in this. It's like, no, you, you figure out pretty early on the ghouls are doing bad things. Right. And, uh, and, you know, so, and since it is ghouls, some of the stuff is a little dark. Um, you're talking about themes. So we've got a little bit of darker themes. Uh, Christopher Lockie wrote chapter one. Oh, um, and he's a big Lockie. fan. Of, <laughs> yeah. But right? he goes super dark. <laughs> he's, he's a big fan of dark things. So, yes. uh, so that is <laughs> it was perfect to kick it off. Honestly. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it is perfect. But that is, I guess, something that, that people need to keep in mind. I mean, it's, you know, this isn't just some random guy that's like, I want to have power and I'm going to kill people. No, this, these are ghouls and they're eating people and murdering people and all kinds of wonderful, not necessarily good for seven year old things. Right. Yeah. So we've got a little bit of darkness in, in some of our themes. There's a little bit of world travel or a decent bit of world travel. Um, so the players get to go on a lot of little road trips, but the we've built in kind of faster travel in some parts of it. So the players aren't bogged down with, okay, now you get to spend two months traveling to the countryside, right? There's a couple of real spots of brightness. I mean, you mentioned the dark, right? But I think, I mean, the way I look at the story, there's also a couple of places where it's really clear that people are shining beacons of goodness, right? There's a couple of NPCs, um, there's a, a particular item, a holy item that's super helpful and comes out of a history of, you know, resisting the ghouls and fighting the good fight and being a big undead slayer. Gotcha. Um, and, and, you know, likewise, there's lore that comes from people who have fought these ghouls before. There's a Librum of Radiance thing in the treasures section. Anyway, so... Yeah, okay, there's lots of really bad stuff happening. But if you're taking those side trips and you're following up on clues, then you're also collecting a, a war chest um, of tools and information that will make your trip into the Underdark um, more survivable by far. Definitely. Do we want to yeah. talk about the treasure section? I don't know. Maybe it's too soon. Do we want, yeah, I think I think treasure's a little too soon, Wolfgang. Yeah. I mean, that was just unlocked. You know, know, when Wolfgang's alone on these, I can get him to tell me everything. <laughs> uh, so it's probably good you're here, Megan. <laughs> yeah, we did unlock some stretch goals, which basically lead to an appendix full of magic items, um, oh, both incredible. right and dark and so that's all i'm going to say about that but it's so it's full of some great stuff gotcha. so at what level do we unlock the ghoul swole balls when does that happen uh, uh i don't know <laughs> i don't know if we've like ever something. had a, yeah, a ghoul. well no we we do actually have a dark old dragonborn oh, not in this nice. adventure but in Warlock 8, um, the uh, Warlock 8 Undead. Oh, yeah, uh, the patch. Yeah, yeah, that one um, we do have. Now, there's no stats for her, but she leads a special organization of ghouls. But she's a Darkle Dragonborn. I think that's the only time we've had a Darkle that was not like one of your more typical humanoids. Yeah, they don't. The reptilian races don't turn into, into ghouls that quickly or easily. But yeah, so there's one. She's buff. She's nice. scaly. She's <laughs> but I don't know about kobolds. I don't know if kobolds have the constitution to be able to actually survive the dark wool <laughs> conversion process. Well, yeah, maybe like not the, regular kobolds, but swobolds, I would assume. Swobolds are all buff, and they are, yeah. I think regular kobolds die of ghoul fever in droves, so they just don't become ghouls. But you're right, swobolds. Mm -hmm. ghouls. Well, see, now you've just created a new horror to taunt the players with um, at some point. Um, <laughs> especially those who running this and like, I, I was a backer on the Kickstarter and I know everything about it. Mm, I got something in my back pocket here that James suggested. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone. You're welcome. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously we're going to have encounter tables, we're going to have these side tracks, we're going to have red herrings. Um, so the main story is is there the framework is strong it all links up but if you just love the underdark and you want like your mm -hmm. characters to spend a lot of time exploring the mushroom forest you know that's an option um it's not 
it's not going to advance the storyline, but you'll have a great time exploring it. Um, and so we're we're trying to add we're trying to cover all the bases, right? Like new player options, exploration, and a strong story. Nice. Um, I think we've got it. I mean, Chris Lockie's one of the writer, Richard Green, Kelly Pollock, Mike Wellam's got a chunk. I'm doing some. John Sawatsky's doing stuff. Uh, we have quite a big. You, you know, forgot like, Jeff Lee. Oh my God, Jeff Lee's doing like most of the layers too. Oh, yeah. Wow. Should, yep. And he did chapter three. And chapter three. Oh, oh, geez. I've read chapter three. Jeff's a bad, bad man. Yes. <laughs> oh, like, come on. It's an awesome chapter. <laughs> it is in a, okay. I'm, I'm for once going to zip it. Cause it's so great. I don't want to spoil That's it, but true. it's the, Oh, I want to say it's the blood cults, but I don't really want to say. Oh, I see. One of the things that I find really intriguing and love about this is this isn't just a, here's an adventure in a book. This is two books. Uh, that people are getting and one goes to the players yeah well that's always or that's that's relatively new for us right like for tales of the old margrave which Mm -hmm. uh is is shipping now that kickstarter was last year and it's it's going to be on shelves in a few days here having a player book is just a great chance to say who really belongs in this adventure right like who Mm -hmm. would be the most at home most entertaining not straight out of the player's handbook, like oddballs, right? Right, exactly, um, exactly. So my favorites there are the Darrow, who were part of a, an adventure I wrote for Dungeon a long time ago, and I've never quite gotten over my my love for the crazy little dwarves. Um, they're delightful and weird, and they're not everyone's cup of tea to play. They can be super annoying to everyone else at the table because mm-hmm. they're not here with the rest of us right they have their share of of mental quirks and aberrations and at the same time they see through things into the void and the higher regions and they have visions that come true sometimes um sometimes they just leap off a cliff uh it's it's one of those where we did a version of the darrow in unlikely heroes and we're expanding that with a couple of new racial variants and I think maybe a subclass or two here. And that's our approach to the Underworld Player's Guide. Um, Megan, you've seen some of the turnovers or maybe some of the John Sawatsky back and forth commentary. Like, you know, the mushroom folk are getting built out. The drow are getting a bunch of expansion because why wouldn't you, right? If you're not running Empire of the Ghouls, there might be some drow still all around. Um Dark Trollkin are on our stretch goal list. I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, oh, and thanks, Wolfgang. Just spoil upcoming stretch goals. Oh my god, I'm doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> I have high hopes for that but one. But for <laughs> for more details on the the player's guide, we actually did a little bit of a Q and A type thing on one of our earlier updates. I think it's called Day Three in the Player's Guide, something like that. Um, and we actually answered a few like more common questions about the player's guide because oh, gotcha. uh, we figured that some people, because we're assuming that there are more players than DMs, right? Uh, so we figured, you know what? We should probably answer some questions. Just kind of hit these questions before we get inundated with all of these. Well, is it going to include this? Is it going to include this? <laughs> so uh, we right. had a, a few basic things there. Nice. Yeah. I mean, we're doing like, I forget, five or six races with the stretch goals so far. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a bunch of subclass material that we're looking at. Maybe some new. Sp- oh, we definitely some new magic. Yeah, we unlocked new magic stuff in the stretch goals. So. Yep, we already unlocked some of that. Uh, so there's there's basically a toy box, right, for players. It's like, do you want a new background? Do you want a new race? A variant race? An expansion? Um, or do you want to play a? They're all a little bit darker or a little bit weirder because well, they live in the underdark. Right. Um, so we, we went pretty heavy on the dark fantasy with these guys and we stuck mostly to the, not the surface races because most of the more regular surface, the likely heroes live on the surface in the sunshine. Um, (laughs) they're in the player's handbook, but the weird ones, um, we're, we're giving you a chance with, with some of these backgrounds. I, really happy with some of what Kelly's doing there. 
uh, and John and, and the other designers. We're also going to play test this material this summer. Um, and Kickstarter backers get at least a chunk of playtest material um, come summertime. And we'll be looking for people's reports. It's kind of like on Earth Arcana, right? Like, here's the thing. It's not final and totally baked, but we feel pretty good about it. Go beat up on it for a while. Tell us what you think. Uh, so we'll do that probably with some of the major encounters and the adventures uh, and some of the player's guide material as well. For the player's guide material, um, that's all. I mean, we're releasing it with Empire of the Ghouls. But it is something if players just want to play these kinds of things and have no interest in the campaign itself, it it's it can be played separately. Like it's not all super tied into the campaign. Oh yeah, like, you can I know, run with some of, out of the abyss or whatever, right? I mean, right, yeah. And, and some of our questions that we got were basically how you know can you play these races in Empire of the Ghouls and then can you play them outside? Well, you can definitely play them outside as long as your you know DM says so. Uh, and then we did end up answering one of those questions in um, in our little. Q and A thing about the player's guide that yes, these we're not just really seeing a bunch of you know dark races to be like here they are and you can't play them in our campaign. Uh, Why no, would the actual we do that, right? That really exactly. a question. <laughs> right? Like, look how awesome they are, but not for you, right? No, exactly. We would never do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we've we've got a little bit of guidance. You know, I mean, they are typically from the more quote-unquote evil races, right? So, you know, you will have a little bit of trouble walking around on the surface. People are going to look at you a little funny. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you can anybody can be a hero. That's awesome. And that's really cool. I was going to ask you about that um, because I know that is a, uh, a thing that has been in Cobalt Press past. So I was hoping that was the case. Uh, this is a really, really exciting thing. Uh, if people want to check out more about Empire of the Ghouls, where should they go and what should they do? And we should mention, uh, too, this is the uh, Cobalt Press Deluxe style Kickstarter with uh, pledge levels that fit all budgets uh, and oh, yes. all sorts of awesome tables to help you figure out which pledge is right for you. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options here and it's really, really well put together. Yeah, we've got full table, uh, virtual tabletop support, PDF support, and print support. So if you play on Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds, we got you covered. If you just want print, we got you covered. If you're all about PDF on your tablet, not a problem. Um, those are all easy options, and you can mix and match to to a pretty high degree. Plus, we have a limited edition that I've been looking at the art. It's mm -hmm. we're going to do a preview sometime before the end of the Kickstarter of um, of what that limited edition will look like. So, if you want to get the fancy one, we only print to order for those. Once they're gone, they're they're gone. That is pretty awesome. And having those, I have a, a couple of those uh, fancier books. Um, mm -hmm. I really like them. They're really, really nice. And one other thing we should mention, uh, this yeah. thing is way, way funded already. So you're breaking oh, yeah. through yeah. stretch goals like crazy. You contribute. You are going to get the product at this point. Uh, it is happening. So oh, yeah. that is really awesome. Uh, as you can hear from Megan and Wolfgang, a lot of the chapters are already in. People are already making things happen. There's all sorts of great stuff that you can check out here on the site. So if people want to learn more about you and what you do, Wolfgang, where should they go and what should they do? Well, sure. Uh, CobaltPress.com is the blog. Um, for me personally, I'm more on Twitter than anywhere these days. Uh, you can find me at Monkey King, and sometimes I'm on the at Cobalt Press Twitter handle, um, though other people on there as well. There's also something called Cobalt Press in Midgard, which is a fan group on mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like not an official company page, but it's super active um, with people sharing questions and stories, and most of the designers are there, including me, uh, answering questions about Cobalt Press products and you know offering solutions to queries about game balance or story or lore. Um, so you can get an answer often from the designer who wrote a product uh, on the Cobalt Press and Midgard Facebook group. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that is a great, great group. Uh, and Megan, where can people find you on the internet? 
Oh, I, I don't really spend too much time on the internet, but sure. Um, <laughs> I guess the easiest way would be on Twitter. I'm a GM Moonwolf. Be the easiest way to find me, I guess, that way. I, I'm just the editor. I just like hang out in the back and make stuff look good. I don't really. But yeah, I mean, if people really want to say hi, I mean, that would be where be yeah. on Twitter. So let me. Uh, this is very modest. Megan is a super good editor, as mentioned earlier. You are a. Uh, I mean, I think a partner in writing with everyone uh, and a more important cog in the wheel probably than, yes. uh, than a bunch of us writers are. So uh, you'll notice well, Chris, I would say Chris more Lockie important, isn't but, here, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> We try to bring the writers in, but they're all busy scribbling, right? So exactly, exactly. Maybe on a future occasion we can trap uh, Richard Green in a, you know, some sort of uh, psychic force cage and get him to answer questions. <laughs> One of my favorite people and designers for sure. So that would be great. Oh, yeah, which is um, great. Yeah. Or Chris yeah. Lockie or Jeff Lee or Kelly. I don't even know if Kelly's ever been on the show. <laughs> we got a lot of awesome options. Well, thank you yes. both so much for joining me today on Tabletop Apple. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. What a great interview with everybody. Thank you so much to Alex, Wolfgang, and Megan. Hey, do you want to support the show financially? It would be a big help. Help us pay for a lot of the costs of the show. You can do that by heading on over to patreon.com slash intracasso, and you can show me that this show means something to you financially. If you have the means, I would really, really appreciate it. So it's patreon.com slash intracasso. Plus, when you become one of my Patreon supporters, you get to help decide the direction of upcoming episodes of Tabletop Babel. Uh, you get to get some extra content through me. There's a little web chat that I do once a month, so go check it out. All of the rewards and levels are at patreon.com slash I-N-T-R-O-C-A-S-O. And if you want to support the show for free, you can do that in just a minute by creating an iTunes account, heading on over to iTunes, and leaving Tabletop Babel a five-star review. Even if you're not listening through iTunes, odds are your podcatcher app uses iTunes algorithms to rate and recommend a podcast. So head on over to iTunes, do that, you leave us a five-star review, I'll read it out loud, you can make me say anything you want. Pretty fun. All right, people, you can find me on Twitter at James Intracasso. That's at J-A-M-E-S-I-N-T-R-O-C-A-S-O. Also, check out my blog, World Builder Blog, where you can get advice about game design and a couple little extras for free that I'm doing over there. So it's a lot of fun. Go check it out. Tabletop Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding it with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Don't forget, RPGs are like sex. All right, people, I just wanted to let you know that this podcast was brought to you by D&D Beyond. Now, you may know D&D Beyond as people who take D&D, bring it into the digital realm, and make it easier for you to build characters, plan campaigns, share resources with your players near and far. And they do that, and they do that really well, and I love them for it. But one of the things that I also really love about D&D Beyond is how much stuff they're giving away for free. I'm talking about Todd Kenrick's interviews. I'm talking about James Hake's articles. I'm talking about articles I've written that Mike Shea has written. There's so much good stuff over on D&D Beyond com that you can go check out totally, totally for free. It is a hub, a place where we gather to bring about content for the world's greatest role-playing game. So go check it out, dndbeyond.com. You will not be disappointed.